Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Um, this is the clinical skills video for visual acuity. And before the actual method is demonstrated, just a small presentation uh, to tell you certain specific things that will make the, the video more relevant and easier to understand. Uh, so let's just define visual acuity first, and I'm sure you've done this before when you were doing your special senses. So your visual acuity is your ability to uh, distinguish between two points and, and recognize them as being separate. So in other words, it's the resolving power of the eye. And in other words, it's the minimum angle between any two visual inputs that can be resolved by the eye. That is, they can be uh, detected as being separate. And the simplest definition is being able to, to being able to recognize two objects being separate from one another. And all of this, this visual acuity uh, uh, process is something that only checks a very specific function of your retina, and that's the fovea. I'm sure you've been through the, the refractive error discussion that's been uploaded and being shared with you, and it has quite a bit of detail as to what is visual acuity, visual field, how they relate to the retina and how they are tested. But simply, visual acuity is something that is the function of the fovea and that tests or checks for something that's right in front of you, your objects of interest. Visual field is everything around it and visual field, the quality or the, 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 the quality of vision is not as good because the light is not falling on the fovea which has the maximum concentration of cones and the so shortest pathway to the photoreceptors as compared to the rest of the retina. And the rest of the retina is checked by doing something called visual field, which we'll be doing in a future video. So go over the refractive error discussion. Uh, it'll make this easier for you to understand. And I don't know why in this in this video, this this arrow keeps moving from the fovea when I check the presentation, it's, it's always on it. I don't know why that is. Uh, maybe everything is good, but this arrow is basically on the fovea and this is the fovea. So visual acuity is for objects right in front of you. Visual field is objects that are uh, around your, your gaze, your position, or your, where your eyes are pointing. So today we'll be checking visual acuity and that is basically a function of the fovea. So all of these definitions that we are doing, resolving power of the eye, the minimum angle between two visual inputs of being able to recognize two objects as separate is basically when we are testing the fovea. Um, again, this diagram, and another way of doing it is if you've ever flown a kite, and I'm sure all of you have, and you're really far away, and, and there is another kite flying, and you don't know where that kite is, is in relation to your, specifically the string of the kite, because you can see the, the string, but you can't make out whether there are two strings or one, because your eye does not have enough of a resolving power, uh, and why does it have a limit to it? It's, it's, resolution we'll just do in the next slide. But if you get closer, maybe you're able to recognize them as separate and maybe if your vision isn't good, maybe now you're able to recognize the separate. So this is what resolving power is, being able to recognize that these two objects are separate and not a single object. Uh, why this happens is because of something called the airy disk. Uh, this is not that difficult to understand, but requires a little bit of understanding of optics. Imagine these are the two lines that you want to see and these are the photoreceptors in your retina. Now when light enters the eye and all the refractive media, as we had already done in refractive error discussion, when it falls in the photoreceptors, it does not fall as a single beam of light. It rather falls as this sinusoidal wave. And the reason this is happening is because it's passing through various mediums, so it is sort of changing its quality or its nature. So it falls as, as these sinusoidal waves. Um, and these are called the airy disks. Now in order to recognize two objects as separate, as being different from an, uh, one another, their respective airy disks, the, the way the light is falling on the photoreceptors, the crests of these, of these airy disks must fall on discrete photoreceptors, i.e. on different photoreceptors. So this line's crest of the airy disk must stimulate one photoreceptor. And if we want to recognize this line as being different from this or discrete, then the, the crest of its airy disk, which is this, must fall on another photoreceptors. So now the eye would know, yeah, I'm looking at, at two different lines. But what would happen if these were too close to one another, like the example of the kite I was giving you? So what would happen is their, the, their airy disks would be very close and, and 
the crest of their AD disc would tend to fall on a single photoreceptor rather than two. So these objects, while, while being different and distinct, would appear single to you simply because they're not further apart and they're stimulating uh, they're not stimulating discrete photoreceptors. This is a very, very oversimplification of this rather complicated process, but it does sort of get the message across that for your eye to resolve two objects as separate resol resolving power, they must be separated by some distance, and that distance equates to uh, roughly the distance between the distance between two photoreceptors such that that the airy disk, the way the light is falling on the photoreceptors of the object, the crest of the airy disk uh, falls on one photoreceptor, and if we want to recognize another object as separate, its crest of its airy disk must fall on a different photoreceptor, or a discrete photoreceptor. Now you know that these two lines are different and not one. But if these two lines are too close to one another, their airy disks are close, the crest of airy disks are close, they'd rather stimulate a single photoreceptor so that you see one rather than two. So this is why your eye has a limited resolving power. So how much gap should be between two objects for your eye to be able to recognize them at two? Well, that is about one minute of an arc. What is one minute of an arc? I'm sure you remember angles. Angles are measured in degrees. A smaller unit of degree is a minute. So one degree has 60 minutes, just like one minute has 60 seconds. So if we, if you've seen this, I'm sure it's Snell's visual equity chart, and, you, and these are drawn to a certain specific specification. You just can't draw your own, you know, according to your own whim, according to your own size. Hey, I'll draw an E of this size, an F of this size. No, each letter, let's look at the top letter. This, and this is your I, and this is the fovea. So each um, component of this letter, and there are five, this, this white bit, this, this white bit again, and this black bit. So there are five components, and each component subtends an angle of one minute on your fovea. When you're looking at this object from 60 meters, remember this is the six, uh, 60 meters, because remember this is the top letter, this is the 660 letter. Um, so at, at if you're say, seeing this letter from, uh, from 60 meters, each component of this letter would make an angle of one degree at your fovea. So the entire letter is going to make up about five minutes, or one minute, not one degree, sorry. So each component makes one minute. The entire letter makes five minutes because there are five components to it. One, two, three, four, and five. So each of them is subtending an angle of one minute on the fovea. And because each of them is one minute, and remember uh, your, your resolute, the, the limit of your resolution is one minute, so the, the photoreceptors in your retina can recognize this part of this letter as separate from this. And that is why you see an E and not a blotch or a botch uh, instead of an E because each uh, leg component, whatever you might, might, might want to call, uh, call it, is making an angle of one minute at a given distance. And for this letter, this, this, for the size of this letter, the distance is... Uh, 60 meters if you're doing the meter chart, which most of the world does. And if standing at 60 meters, your eye should be able to see this letter easily if you have a normal eye, no refractive error, no other issues, uh, pathologies in your eye, because it's designed as such so that each component makes an angle of one minute and your eye can resolve if two objects are at least one minute apart. So this black bit is at least one minute away from this white bit and this white bit is one minute away from this black bit and this black bit is one minute away from this white bit and this white bit is one minute away from this black bit. So all of these are one minute away and all of these are stimulating photoreceptors in a way so that they all are recognized as discrete objects, one, two, three, four, five, and the brain can sort of compose an image which calls it an E because remember you are taught it is an E. You see new things, you can recognize their shape but you don't know what they are, you only give it a name after you're taught or you know what they are, you have learned what they are. Let's not use the word taught, it's not a good word. So let's see what these numbers on a Snell's letter chart mean. And let's pick the top letter, which is called the 660 letter. This basically means, the 60 number means that at 60 meters, this letter will make an angle of five minutes at the fovea, and this 60 meter, when the eye is at 60 meters from the chart. So that's what we just did. This. this letter is designed in a way that when you are at 60 meters, this entire letter would make an angle of five minutes at the fovea. 
because each of these components or limbs or stems of this letter is about uh, one is one minute apart. So it is drawn to a very specific specification. It was done, I think, um, late, mid to late 19th century. But don't quote me on this. Uh, so let's look at this letter. This is from the 66 line and we have another E here and this E, let's see what this 66 means. This 6 means that at 6 meters, this letter would make an angle of 5 degrees uh, at the fovea uh, when you are 6 meters, uh, when your eyes are 6 meters from the chart. So all of these letters are calibrated as such that at the given distance, which is the denominator, the number that's uh, below the hash, or the slash or the denominator, uh, that at this distance, when your eye is at this distance from this letter, which is, is called an optotype because it's drawn to that certain specification that we are talking about, would make an angle of five degrees at the fovea with the eye. This would make an angle of five, five minutes, sorry. This would make an angle of five minutes at 36 meters, five minutes at 24 meters, all of these letters individually, uh, five uh, minutes at 18, meters and this E and all of these letters, D, E, F, B, O, T, E, C, they have various letters depending upon which chart you're using, would make, uh, this E would make an angle of five minutes at the fovea when the eye is at six meters from the chart. So now we know what these, for this number, this lower number indicates, uh, let's see what this fraction indicates. So when look at this E chart and when you're writing visual acuity, this number indicates the place where your patient is reading the chart from, that is where he is sitting, because most of the time visual acuity is done when you're sitting. And this number indicates the line which he is reading at the point where he is sitting. So if he is reading the top letter only, his visual acuity, and sitting at six meters, his visual acuity is going to be 660. If he was reading this line while sitting at six meters, his visual acuity or her visual acuity is going to be 618. So the numerator represents the distance at which the patient is reading the chart from or where he's sitting, and the denominator represents the line that the patient can read while he is at the distance which he or she is sitting. Um, so let's just go over this clinical skill outline because the video is going to show you the actual demonstration and your clerkship manual has the complete listing. So I'll just outline uh, the method here. And this is basically the seven steps that we have done before in the introduction to clinical skills video. I am, I am sure you've seen that. And the prerequisites for this uh, skill are your yeah, Snell's visual acuity chart, a pinhole, a room of inadequate length and illumination. Illumination is something that is sort of variable these days. Many uh, Stenel charts are already illuminated, retro illuminated from behind to an ideal illumination. So room illumination is not that relevant anymore. But if you have a Stenel chart that is not illuminated, then the room illumination comes into play. Uh, all of these things are provided to you, the Stenel chart, the pinhole, and the room illumination. Uh, if a pinhole is not available, you can't find it, you can simply make one, but most of the time you can't find it is because you haven't done the clinical method enough and your eyes cannot see what your mind doesn't know. And if you don't know that you need to use a pinhole, if the pinhole is lying in front of you, you will never use it. You should have your own torch because torch is something that might, that is uh, a requirement for visual acuity testing at times when the patient's uh, vision is so poor that he can't even see a hand movement. That again is given in your clerkship manual and also uh, described or shown in the video as well. So the idea is, and this is just an overview, the exact details are in the video as well as the clerkship manual. So you're combining all of these. So generally your patient sits at six meters um, and the Stendhal chart is either retro illuminated or the room has enough illumination and you have taken your consent, you have greeted the patient, you have explained what you're going to do and uh, you have asked the patient if he wears glasses or not for distance and then you cover one eye and then you pass your instructions that what I want you to do is to read the chart and continue reading it. And obviously before all of this, you have asked the patient actually that with each eye individually, he can at least see the top letter and he can read or understand the language that's being displayed. That's why we have E charts and uh, English charts. Urdu charts are there, but they are very badly calibrated and I would highly recommend not using them and using an E chart if your patient can't read English. So you cover one eye, the patient is, might, might not be wearing his correction depending upon if he has them. 
or he uses them. Sometimes patients forget their glasses even though they're using it, but you still must ask, do you wear glasses? And if you're wearing glasses, put them on. Because there's no point doing visual acuity if the patient already uses glasses. You know his vision is not going to be uh, good enough, distant vision uh, glasses. My, when I say glasses, I mean spectacles. So you put them on and then you ask the patient to cover one eye, usually the left eye first, to test the right eye with the palm of your hand. Remember palm covering the entire eye, not like this not like this you don't want to squish your eye the vision gets very blurry because you're disrupting your tear film and you're pressing your eyeball so use the palm of your eye and gently close the eye and remember this is all adult visual testing or visual testing and individuals who can read are old enough to read that is and also old enough to express uh, speak because they're they're verbal and they can follow your commands uh, undergraduates usually are not expected to do visual acuity in pre-verbals or in special cases where the patient has trouble communicating with the uh, uh, with the doctor or the technician or the optometrist as the case may be. So appropriate eye is covered and the patient is asked to read and what you do is you keep on noting how far the patient has read down the chart then if required use a pinhole if required uh, if the patient can't read anything uh, then do the other eye and uh, repeat the process in the other eye. But what if your patient can't see any of the letters while sitting at this distance so what you do is uh, you make the patient move one meter ahead and you keep asking, can you see the top letter? And you move him till he can see the top letter. And that's it. You don't want him to read the entire chart once he is off six meters. So from standing here, if he says, I can see the T, his visual acuity is going to be four meters because now he is at four meters, not at six, and he can see the top letter. Once you are away from six meters, nearer to the chart than six meters, all you're interested in is when he sees the top letter. So your visual acuity is 460. You don't want if you're writing visual acuity as 436, the patient is probably 560. So you're wrong. So you need to ensure that, and you need to remember this, that once your patient is off six meters and is nearer to the chart than six meters, all you're interested in is knowing when he sees the top letter and you just note down that visual acuity at five meters, is, uh, at five meters he can see the 60 meter voila letter at the top letter. You don't want him to read the entire chart once he is off the six meter standard. And also, you, you, when you want to do pinhole testing, you only do pinhole testing at six meters. So you move the patient back at six meters, give him a pinhole and test him. You don't make him move and hold a pinhole and then test. These details are given in your clerkship manual, so you can review them. So the general uh, things to remember is to perform in both eyes, to perform visual uh, pinhole testing if required, and note visual acuity, and also uh, remember whether the patient was uh, using uh, glasses and if he and you need to ask this question because it is essential because if you're testing vision without uh, uh, spectacles and you're really not noting the vision with the with which the patient presented with if he doesn't have his spectacles that's another thing at least you did your job and you asked the question and that's the same thing that we do it's not that we're asking you to do it and we don't do it so this is how a pinhole works and this is again given in your clerkship manual it sort of only limits the rays that are passing through the center of the lens, lens which does not require refraction and sort of uh, tells you that the, yeah maybe this 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 visual acuity uh, difference or anomaly may be due to a refractive error but remember pinholes only deal with a certain range of refractive errors between plus and minus five diopters and i'm sure you know why that is that is the limit of uh, pinhole functionality so how do we record visual acuity? So we write the right eye at the top, the left eye at the bottom. We write P if the patient is not able to read at least half the letters in a line. For example, if the line has six letters and the patient is able to read uh, three of them, you write partial because he wasn't able to read all of the letters. Then you write a pinhole finding and right eye and then left eye. If a pinhole is not required if the patient is 6'6", six, six, you don't check beyond 6'6", six, six, because although some patients might be 6'5", or 6'4", six, 6'6", six, six is considered to be the norm. So if a patient is 6'6", six, six, don't use a pinhole, you're wasting time. And write P for partial again if the patient is not able to read the entire letters, or if there is no improvement with pinhole, I'll just show you how to write that. And then you write this, it means with correction, if the patient was wearing his glasses. So if the patient was able to read all the way down to the last line, you write 6'6", six, six, but with the other eye, I wasn't able to read anything at the 6 meters, but was able to see the top line at 4 meters, so you write 460. Remember, there is no 436, no 536. It's just 60 when the numerator is not 6. Write partial if the visual acuity was such that the patient wasn't able to read at least half the letters. So in this eye, there is no question of uh, partiality uh, because at at 
um, you don't do pinholes once the patient is off. Uh, um, six meters uh, partial there is no question of partiality once you are off six meters because you are only interested in knowing the the top line uh, re may the patient reading the top line then you write your pinhole findings but remember pinhole is not done at four meters pinhole is to move the patient back to six meters and do it so we do a pinhole here it's six six we do a pinhole here in nih nih means no improvement with pinhole so it was the same with pinhole and then you write partial again, if the patient wasn't able to do anything better, maybe uh, the same as before. So you uh, could have written NIPH or maybe read two letters here and three letters here, less than half the letters. Or don't write P if he had corrected all the way or read more than half of the letters. There is no question of P here because there is no improvement with pinhole. So the P here would only make sense if the patient read one letter here and was partial, read two letters here, was still partial. If he was able to read more than half the line, it, it's not partial anymore. And there is no question of partiality here. And you write CC if this was with glasses, and if it was with, without glasses, you don't write that CC thing. Uh, pinhole can also be used over spectacles. Remember that if a patient is wearing spectacles and has uh, this vision, you still do pinhole testing because you can put a pinhole over a spectacle. And you need to know whether this spectacle needs a change. For example, if he is 6x partial and with pinhole he becomes 6x, it probably implies that the number needs to be changed now. Finally, just a word about projection. Projection is basically checking when your visual acuity is lower than hand movement. So you do perception and projection. Perception is easier. It's given in your clerkship manual, also done in the video. I'm just going to show you a projection in a little detail and to make you understand. Projection is basically testing whether all of your retina is working fine or not, and you divide your retina into four quadrants. So we divide it into a temporal quadrant, a nasal quadrant, a superior and an inferior quadrant. For the, this is for the left eye. So you draw an X, you can draw the X right below the, line, uh, the eye. I'm drawing it here because you'll just figure out why in a minute. And you can draw one for the right eye. I'll just do the left eye here. So when I'm shining the light from the nasal side, I'm illuminating the temporal retina and testing the temporal retina. And if the patients can, and the instruction is catch the light and make sure the other eye is completely covered and the patient is looking straight, not looking towards the light. If he's looking towards the right, then you're not checking a specific quadrant. Um, and you write, if he says, no, I can't catch the light, I can't see anything, you write a minus. When you shine the light superiorly, you are checking the inferior retinal quadrant. And if the patient says yes, you put a plus. When you're shining light from the temporal side, you're checking the nasal retinal quadrant. If the patient says, yes, I can see it, you write a plus. When you sh shine light inferiorly, you're checking the superior retinal quadrant. If the patient can say, yes, you check, you write a plus here. And that is why I put the, the cross here because the light was coming here. And that is how you note projection. This projection tells you that in three quadrants, the retina is working and one is not. Maybe it has a vascular problem, traumatic problem, inflammatory problem, anything. But right now we know that the projection is faulty. If you show this patient just light, he will say, yes, I can see light because light is like straight ahead. If this is my eye, the light is coming like this. Never put a pencil like this towards your eye. You never know when you might have the inclination to poke your eye with it. So I'm using the rubber side. And this is the pen light and it's going like this. So it's illuminating all of your retina. So the eye would be picked up because these three quadrants are working. So projection is always necessary when your visual acuity is below hand movement together with perception of light. So I hope this was useful. Use this in conjunction with what's coming afterward, the actual video and also your clerkship manual. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask in your WhatsApp group by email. Call us, do anything but do ask. Don't hold back because it's really important we figure out that you're understanding things uh, because from the looks of things, this is the way we are doing uh, things for quite some time. Thank you very much. <laughs> मुआयने के दौरान आपको कोई दर्द या तकलीफ नहीं होगी क्या आपकी इजाजत है ठीक है क्या आप दूर के लिए कोई चश्मा इस्तेमाल करती हैं ठीक है आप पढ़ी लिखी हैं अंग्रेजी पढ़ लेती हैं ठीक है आप अपने बाएं हाथ की हथेली से अपनी बाई आंख को बंद करें पूरी तरह से और आप बताएं कि जो सबसे ऊपर लफ्ज लिखा है वो क्या है अब इसी तरह से दूसरे हाथ से दाएं हाथ की हथेली से दाएं आंख को बंद करें और ऊपर सबसे बताएं क्या लिखा हुआ है नहीं पता नहीं पता ठीक है अब आप दोबारा से अपनी बाई आंख को बाई आंख की हथेली से बंद कर लें और ऊपर से पढ़ना शुरू करें और जहां तक पढ़ सकती हैं वहां तक लफ्ज पढ़ती हैं टी वाई ओ एच वी यू टी ए एम वाई यू एच डब्ल्यू एक्स डी बस 
ठीक है अब आप अपने हाथ को आपके हाथ में मैं एक छोटा सा सुराख पकड़ा रहा हूँ ठीक है अपनी बाएं हाथ से हथेली से बाएं हाथ को बंद रखें और सुराख को आपके आगे में और इस सुराख के दरमियान में से देखने की कोशिश करें कि जहां तक आपने पहले पढ़ा था उससे कुछ बेहतर नजर आता है उसके पढ़ें जहां तक मैं पढ़ सकती हूँ यू एच डब्ल्यू एक्स ओ टी एक्स ओ बाई एम वाई टी एम ए डब्ल्यू आई चाल ठीक है इससे नीचे नहीं पढ़ा जाता आपको इससे इस आगे की मदद से चाल ठीक हो गया ये मुझे देते हैं अब आपने करना यह है कि अपनी दाई आंख को दाई आंख की हथेली से बंद करें एक दफा दोबारा कोशिश करें ऊपर पढ़ने की पढ़ा जाता है ठीक है अब आपने करना यह है कि खड़ी हो जाए और आपने एक कदम आगे की तरफ आने जाए मैं आपको कहूंगा उस वक्त आगे की तरफ आई देगा आपने एक कदम आगे की तरफ आए आप देखें कुछ पढ़ा जाता है आपसे ठीक है एक कदम फिर आगे की तरफ आए अब पढ़ा जाता है आपसे एक कदम फिर आगे की तरफ आए अब पढ़ा जाता है आपसे एक कदम फिर आगे की तरफ आए अब पढ़ा जाता है आपसे एक कदम आगे और आ जाएं। अब पढ़ा जाता है आपसे एक कदम और आगे आए अब आपसे कुछ पढ़ा जाते ठीक है अब आप वापस यहां पे तशरीफ रखी हुई थी वहीं पे चले जैसे पहले आपने अपनी आंख को बंद किया था दाई आंख को दाई आंख की हथेली से बंद कर लें अब आप मुझे ये बताएं कि मैं आपको अपनी उंगलियां दिखाऊंगा आपने मुझे सिर्फ ये बताना है कि ये कितनी उंगलियां हैं ठीक है आपने मैं आपको बार बार नहीं पूछूंगा जब मैं आपके आगे अपनी उंगलियां लाऊंगा आपने मुझे बताना है उंगलियां कितनी हैं ठीक है पता चलता है आपको कितनी उंगलियां हैं ठीक है अब मैं दोबारा आपको थोड़ा सा आपके करीब आके इसी तरह से अपनी आपको उंगलियां दिखाऊंगा ठीक है आपने मुझे बताना है आपको नजर आती हैं या नहीं नहीं आ रही नहीं नजर आती ठीक है अब मैं आपके आगे अपना हाथ हिलाऊंगा ठीक है आपने मुझे सिर्फ इतना बताना है कि आपको मेरा हाथ हिलता हुआ नजर आता है या नहीं आता मैं आपसे बार बार नहीं पूछूंगा जब आपको हिलता हुआ नजर आए तो आपने बताना हिलता हुआ नजर आता है ठीक है आपको कुछ अपनी आंखों के आगे हिलता हुआ नजर आया था ठीक है अब मैं आपकी आंख में थोड़ी सी तेज रोशनी डालूंगा अगर आपको पता चले कि आपकी आंख में रोशनी पड़ रही है तो आपने मुझे बताना है कि आपको रोशनी नजर आ रही है मैं आपसे बार बार नहीं पूछूंगा सिर्फ रोशनी डालूंगा और आपने बताना है रोशनी नजर आती है या नहीं ठीक है सामने सीधा देखते रहे दोनों आंखों से ये खोल नहीं दोनों आप आप आंख में बंद रखनी है अभी है जब रोशनी चली जाए तो फिर भी आपने बताना है रोशनी अब है अब नहीं अभी रोशनी है नहीं ठीक है अब मैं मुख्तलिफ तरफ से ऊपर से नीचे से दाएं से बाएं से अतराफ से रोशनी आपकी आंख में डालूंगा आपने अपने बाएं हाथ से उस रोशनी को पकड़ना है ठीक है देखता आपने सीधे रहना है आपने अपनी आंख नहीं हिलानी आपने रोशनी जिस तरफ से आ रही है उस तरफ से आपने रोशनी को पकड़ना है ठीक है आपने अपनी दाया बंद रखी है तेजी से और दूसरे हाथ से आपने रोशनी को पकड़ना है ठीक है पकड़े रोशनी को कहां से आ रही है पकड़े दोबारा से पकड़े कहां से आ रही है अब मैं दोबारा से आपको वो सुराख दूंगा आप इसको इस दफा अपनी बाया के आगे रखें और सामने देखते हुए देखें अब चार्ट में से आपको कुछ नजर आता है आपके दादों का बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया ओके नाउ वी गोइंग टू नोट द विजुअल आर्टिटी ऑफ आर केस एंड द वे टू डू दैट इज टू राइट बी एड फॉर विजुअल आर्टिटी 
and the right eye visual acuity goes at the top and the left eye visual acuity goes at the bottom and with the right eye the patient was able to read the 612 line so we write 6 by 12 the numerator indicates the distance at which the patient was sitting at and the denominator indicates the line that the patient was able to read so in my case while sitting at 6 meters my case was able to read the line that a normal person is able to read at 12 meters so I write 612 when we put a pinball in front of the eye the patient was able to read all the way down to the 6 meter line that implies while sitting at 6 meters my patient was able to read the 6 meter line but wasn't able to read all of the letters so we write P indicating partial for the left eye between 6 meters and 1 meter my case wasn't able to read any of the letters on the chart so we cannot use Snell's chart as a way of notifying the visual acuity then what we did was we uh, asked the patient to count or the case to count the number of fingers that we were holding up at 2 feet and then at 1 feet the patient wasn't able to tell us the number of fingers then we asked the patient to identify whether a hand was moving at about a distance of a foot from the patient and the patient was able to do anything about that either wasn't able to tell us whether the hand was moving or not and then finally we went down to light perception and projection both of these tests are done together in the sense you can't do perception uh, project, uh, light perception and not do projection these two go hand in hand and what they tell us is the retina able to perceive light which is light perception and light projection is, is all of the retina perceiving it because when you are shining the light diffusely straight ahead it is telling the light is shining everywhere in the retina all of the retina is stimulated so you're not really sure if it is it if it is all of the retina that's not working or a specific quadrant so for our patient light perception was positive so we can write LP positive or PL positive P for perception and L for length. Both of these are acceptable. And when we did the projection test, projection is basically telling you if specific quadrants of the retina are being tested or telling you then if they are working properly or not. And one thing you need to remember is that when you are shining the light from various quadrants, the quadrant opposite to where you are shining the light from is actually being stimulated. So if you are shining the light from the bottom, it is the superior retina that's being tested. When you're shining the light from the top, it's the inferior retina. When you're shining the light from the nasal side, it's the temporal retina. And when you're shining the light from the temporal side, it's the nasal retina that's being tested. Now, in our case, if we go back and we see, and we're using the left eye, our patient was able to perceive light superiorly and inferiorly, meaning when I was shining light inferiorly, the superior retina was illuminated and the patient could catch the light. The instruction to do it is, follow the light or catch the light where it is coming from. When I was illuminating the light, when I was illuminating the inferior retina by shining the light from the top, the patient was able to detect where the light was coming from. However, when I was shining the light from the nasal side to stimulate the temporal retina, the patient was not able to pick that up and wasn't sure where the light was coming from or was trying to find where the light is. So we are going to write negative here. And the last quadrant or the quadrant when I was shining the light from the temporal side, the patient was able to pick it up, so the nasal retina was working over it. So here what we understand is that of perception is positive, but that does not always imply that all of the retina is working equally. And then we did the pinhole test and the patient did not improve at all with the pinhole, so they were able to write no improvement with pinhole. So this is how visual acuity uh, in various cases is notified.